um, knit cast of Wouldn't It Be Fun? And I hope it is a lot of fun. I'm really excited to be here with everybody today. Um, this is, it is my plan for this to be a monthly podcast that I will uh, record and stream every first Friday of every month uh, at this time, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 Eastern. Um, and it'll go live on YouTube, but we can also have um, live participants via Zoom, including a special guest every month. And my really special to be here with everybody today. Um, Whoops. And that is, is, is I guess, a um, letting me know that it's up on YouTube. <laughs> that's the echo. And I forgot to mute that. So we know that's working, I guess. Sorry about that. All right. So. As I was saying, I'm super excited to have a guest here today, and my guest is Erin Pirro of Morehouse Farm. Erin, welcome. Thank you, Amy. Really excited to be here and help you kick off what a cool event so that we can connect coast to coast no matter where we are. Thanks. Erin um, is, as she mentioned, on the other coast. Erin's in New York um, on the family farm. <laughs> um, Aaron and I actually got to know each other a couple of, uh, was it a little over a year ago um, at a retreat that was up in Washington State, which was a lot of fun. Of course, we haven't been able to do any of those this year, um, but that was a lot of fun. And we've been able to do some collaborations this year, which were super neat and um, using her yarn and some things that I designed and um, we wanted to tell you about some of that. So Erin um, was talking to me over the summer and she, um, she was telling me about the, the um, knit-alongs that she does with the Morehouse Merino flock. Erin, would you tell us a little bit about that? You bet. Every month we pick a new project to learn or tackle a new technique because they can be intimidating when you're trying to do them by yourself. And I was talking to a knitter the other day who said, it would just be great if I had a real person who could help me through that. So we're trying to make a habit of knitting a little bit every day for yourself so that you can just relax, face your day or wind down, whatever time works for you. But between building that habit and then learning our something new or practicing something new to put in our knitting toolbox we're trying to build the confidence so that you can knit everything that's on your wish list and amy came up with this fantastic idea for a new technique that we hadn't tackled yet called mosaic knitting something she's been really into over the summer so that led us to something called busy drinks and we kicked that off at virtual rhinebeck this year a lot of fun just having to kind of sit and knit and bring your fizzy drink wherever you were and uh, Amy, do you have yours close by? I do, I do. Yeah, Fizzy Drinks was a coaster pattern. And I did these in Erin's yarn, the Morehouse Merino, um, and they're felted. Erin's um, um, Merino yarn is not super washed, so it really lends itself well to felting, which we usually try to avoid. Um, and the funny thing is, when you try to do it on purpose, you find out things don't felt actually like quite as, as easily as you think they will. You know, like it takes some doing. Um, but it, this was a super fun project, and I absolutely loved working with all the different colors that Erin has. I used a variegated on this one, and I used a bunch of different colors on this one. Um, and I have somewhere, I have a, one where I used 10 different colors, but I think those disappeared to my teenager's room. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> so anyway, um, we did some different versions, and Erin did a bunch of different versions, and that was a lot of fun. And I see a couple of comments popping by too. Karen said, I made eight sets of them. And <laughs> I did also, and uh, they were fantastic gifts because you would knit them all in a big square and uh, you didn't even have to weave in the ends. Oh, this is the one downside of the virtual background. But I used <laughs> a chain that had been terribly broken to make this one. And what kind of project can you just go along and cut off whatever ends there are and not worry about it? And you're going to cut it up anyway. So just the, the magic of felting when it works the way you want it to, when you're doing it when you want to, made a really, really easy and neat gift and great way to use up leftovers too. Yeah, I, I love that about this pattern. It kind of breaks all the rules. Um, 
it, you know, I, I even I, in the pattern, it says you do not have to weave in any ends. You could make <laughs> knots. You can just leave them dangling. You cut everything off at the end and the felting, just everything felts together and it just holds together, which is something we're not used to at all. Um, so I absolutely love that. And it was kind of fun to cut into my knitting and to realize that absolutely nothing bad happened. Like these edges are very secure. So um, somebody also asked in the chat if we have the link. Um, the pattern is available a couple different ways. You can get kits from Erin's uh, website, morehousefarm.com. Is that right? That's it. And you can also um, find these on my, you can buy just the pattern if you want through my Ravelry shop and through um, my, I have a pay hip shop too. And you can link to all of those from my website, which is www.deviousknitter.com. And I will absolutely share links. Um, I'll get a chance. Um, and I see some questions going by and other people are answering them, which is awesome. Yeah, you can totally sh do it and felt them in a front loader, right, Erin? You did them in a front loader. I did, and uh, we experimented a couple of uh, times because some of these energy efficiency improvements that have been made to wash your clothes on water that's not as hot as it used to be, does impact the felting. So I ended up using the sanitized cycle, I think was the hottest one on my machine. So check that out just because your water temperature is going to be different from place to place. And uh, I learned that the hard way accidentally felting the blanket I made for my husband's wedding present the night before we got married. Because, you know, why finish a project well ahead of time? Right. And yeah. uh, it out the water was hooked up differently than I expected. So it does felt really well when you want it to even in a front loader <laughs> or when you, even when you don't want it to in a front loader, <laughs> but we still have that throne. We're still married here almost 12 years later. So I think that's a pretty good sign. And so that, I think you showed me that once it started out as like a queen size blanket, right? And then what, the it, <laughs> what did it end up as? It is a couch size throw. That's not quite long enough to tuck under my toes. So oh. out here. <laughs> Yeah. Not good for sitting on the couch. Yeah. And beads. <laughs> It'll catch all the beads that I drop now. There you go. There you go. And so we had a ton of fun with that. And um I absolutely love working with Aaron's yarn. So we did we did some other stuff. I did the Glen this Glenboro cowl in Aaron's yarn too. That was another pattern I put out this year. And I just finished um this sock pattern which is a hiking sock that I did in Erin's yarn also. Um, this is called the Wanderly sock. It is knit in sport weight um, and it's it's a hiking sock. So it's this sort of cushiony, um, thicker sock. It's not done, cause it's not done in sock yarn. Um, this is done in um, the Morehouse Gator yarn, which has a really high twist. So I love it for sock knitting, even though it's bigger than standard sock yarn. And this one is not released yet. This pattern's going to come out mid-January. Um, it's with the test knitters right now, and they're all having a good time with it. Um, so that one will be coming out soon. But I just, I just loved working with that. And is there another one coming? Did I hear? There is. After that one comes out, maybe a month or so after that one, there's going to be. Um, a slightly different hiking sock, also using that same yarn, the Gator yarn, um, and that's going to be called Wanderoo. And that one's going to have some cables that do some different things. So no pictures yet on that one, um, but that'll be coming out. You guys, if you follow me on Instagram and um, Twitter or on Facebook, or I'm Devious Knitter in all those places, by the way, or if you follow or if you're on my website, which is again, DeviousKnitter.com, um, there will be announcements when all those things go up. Yeah. And so I hope we get to do some more knit alongs this this coming year, right? Are we going to do some sock knit alongs on your flock? <laughs> because um, back in oh, probably November, I started asking, what kind of things do you all want to learn in our knit alongs? And our knit alongs are different because, as I said, we're concentrating on learning. It's not a race. In fact, we say you knit at your own speed. And each day we put a little goal of the day and you go through and you check them off when you're done. So if you have a bunch of time on a weekend and you want to knock off four days worth of work, go for it. If you only have time to do one, not a problem. It's about the journey. It's not about uh, racing to the finish. And the other thing that lets you do is, as I said, build that habit of doing something mindful for yourself. So when we started saying, what do you want to learn in 2021? Socks were right at the top of the list. Socks and double knitting. 
and beating. We're working on the end of our beating. Okay, I see short rows coming through. I think we can definitely find something to work on for that too. So Amy, maybe put that on your design list. <laughs> Always interested in hearing what people want to learn and what we need to design for. Yeah, um, which is which is super, you know, I've been doing a lot of sock teaching re recently. Um, I did um, I did a bunch of different small classes for different sock skills. And then I did one before Christmas where we put them all together. And we made these little stockings because we, if you make a miniature one, you know, it doesn't take that long to make and you learn all the same skills. Um, so I'm actually going to do that again um, in uh, end of January. I'm going to teach that as the, as a, as a, I'm going to teach a whole, like a one day, um, six hour long sock class with breaks. <laughs> Um, but we're going to cover all that stuff and we're going to do short row heels this time. And that'll be a lot of fun. Um, but I'm super excited to do the, the, um, the knit along too, with these socks. That'll be a lot of fun. Um, so Aaron, you have such a different life from me that I do. Okay. <laughs> I am, I am, I am suburban person who goes to the knitting store or, you know, um, and, and you live on a farm. So I, I am fascinated by this. You grew up on a farm, right? Yes, I did. And in between a couple, because there's actually three farms in our family. So depending on what you're looking for on a particular day, we can probably point you in the right direction. So tell me about the Morehouse farm, because this, you told me before, this was the first um, super fine merino flock in the United States when it was started, right? Yeah, well, it first started as a 35 acre getaway from New York City because my aunt and uncle, they're not blood relatives, but the kind that you pick after being such good friends of the family and they didn't have any kids. So uh, I kind of got adopted and uh, we, my parents were good friends with them. So we would be helping out on weekends or whenever necessary. And I just got to learn a different part of the sheep industry with them. And Margaret and Albrecht, the founders, were uh, from New York City, is where Albrecht will tell you they immigrated to the U.S. in the 1970s from Europe. And they wanted to get us away from the city, like a lot of people do on weekends. And they decided that if they were going to have a place in the country, it was going to have to work to pay for itself. So they decided that if they were going to start a business venture, it ought to put together the things that they did really well. And Margaret learned to knit as a child in school in Switzerland. And Albrecht always loved the outdoors. And he always says, cows were too big and sheep were just right. And that's how they put together this magic. So they bought the uh, Champion Merino flock at a sheep show in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania in 1983. So they started with some pretty good stock. And then in 1987, they said, you know what? Let's up our game meaning looking for even better wool, because that was always the priority. Whenever they were working on their flock, it was breeding sheep for the best wool possible. And they were able to do that in 1987. They brought the first two super fine Merino rams to the U.S. from Australia. And that's important for two reasons. One, because you couldn't import well, you couldn't export. Australia wouldn't let any ewes go mm. at that time. So it had to be rams. And that's also good for the flock because and when you're looking for a breeding program, you can have one ram and have a, an entire crop of lambs for one ram, whereas one ewe is going to have a lamb or two, maybe triplets. Um, but that helps introduce those genetics into the flock that much faster when you're able to work with a ram. So you know a lot, a lot about farming and about breeding and all these things. Is this is sort of your area of expertise, right? <laughs> Say we split the duties now, but uh, growing up, you kind of have to do all of the jobs along the way just because you never know who's going to be called on to do something. And, you know, everybody deserves a vacation day or, you know, the chance to go to a family wedding. So it's good to have a backup just so you can uh, have a day off every once in a while. So what kinds of things were you doing on the farm when you were young? Because you've been involved in this from really a pretty young age, right? <laughs> so have you ever seen that hashtag helping not helping? <laughs> Right. As a small kid, I was probably not so helpful. Um, but you start out doing chores that you can help with. So as soon as you can lift a water bucket or a bale of hay, you can handle that. You can put grain in feeders. You learn to stay out of the way of sheep uh, when they're coming for their feed. And certainly with 4-H projects, you learn how to train sheep to walk on a halter so that they can be easily handled and keep you safe and them safe too. And uh, then as you get bigger and are able to do more jobs, you get to graduate to helping with things like shearing or hoof trimming because they're like us. We have to trim our nails when 
they get long so we don't get hangnails. Same thing with the sheep. So that's a really good first job in sheep handling in terms of learning how to work with them so that, like you said, you keep everybody safe and you get the job done. So how old were you when you started doing things like, like trimming hooves and shearing sheep? Uh, I was probably 10 when I was trimming hooves for the first time. And then uh, I think I was 12 when I sheared my first sheep and I was dead tired when I was done. <laughs> just one sheep? Just one sheep. The <laughs> people who are good at that make it look so easy. I and mean, when you think about a professional of any kind, you know, whether you're a a golfer or, uh, you know, a sailor or whatever it is that you watch an expert do, they just make it look so easy. And, you know, okay, I got this. I'm going to give this a whirl. And in order to shear a sheep, my dad always says, you have to be knock kneed and pigeon toed because you're holding the animal comfortably between your knees. Mm -hmm. And when I was 12, 150 pound sheep outweighed me by quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah, that seems that seems intimidating. So it's more a question of learning how to handle them. Like if you try to pick up your cat to go to the vet, you need to know how to handle them so that they're comfortable and, uh, you know, will ride with you uh, rather than just, you know, trying to, you know, surprise them that nobody likes that, including any animals. So the more calm you are and working with animals, that always turns out a lot better. Um, and then again, handling them so they're used to it. And that's why it's important to halter break your sheep so that if you need to take them to the vet, you have an easier way to get them there. So how does one halter break a sheep? With lots of patience and lots of practice. <laughs> so it's a lot like a dog to walk on a leash, um, but we'll put a halter on a sheep, which has a nose piece. So over the nose and then one under the chin and around the back of their head and lead on the left. And if you've ever seen horses with bridles, it looks a lot like that. There's no bit though. And in, that helps us do two things. One, you can steer a lot easier when you have a, something that is you know, leading. And then two, sheep have an artery in their neck that if you were to push on, that's not very comfortable. Um, whereas dogs have stronger necks. So that's why they wear collars and leashes. So picture us as little kids, me and my sister, you know, six, seven years old with our 4-H projects, walking our lambs around the pasture, around and around and around. <laughs> <laughs> the neighbors would come out on their porch, I think with their cocktails and just wanted to see what was going on. <laughs> now, did you have just one, did you have one lamb each that you were working with um, as your 4-H project or did you have multiple? And when we started out, it was just one each because it's good to learn from one thing first and get good at it before you start to multiply what you're doing. And then by the time we were in oh, high school, we would be bringing 10, 12 sheep to the shows uh, pretty regularly because uh, if you're in premium money, not only does that help pay the grain bill, it also helps pay for college. So, wow. Well, so Aaron, what is the most memorable thing that has happened to you when you were sheep sharing? <laughs> most memorable thing um can i say before shearing sure was that martha stewart wanted to learn how Ooh. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she was not afraid to come right out and say hey how do i do this because she had for i think a year two black welsh mountain sheep that uh, her friends the fabulous beekman boys had brought her and needed somebody to shear and i was shearing for her neighbor so she uh come, came right out wanted to see how things were done they took some really neat pictures of it and she jumped right in so here i am really worried you know how does the new person do this um really well and uh, she wasn't afraid at all which was mm. fantastic because you know everybody uh you know you're worried when you do something new but she was really gung-ho and she was a really gracious hostess in fact afterwards she brought us up to her house and she made my husband his first espresso so <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome ah, right from sheer and cheap <laughs> that's great I see a comment in the in the chat about somebody really looking forward to visiting the farm soon. And I know I am really hoping that I get to come see the farm this year. You had to do your virtual farm day. Sorry, you've had to do your annual farm days virtually, right? Yeah. So we had this idea and this took a lot of convincing because my uncle's 80 and he values his privacy. Um, but he said, OK, you can open up the farm to visitors two days a year. And we did one in the fall, the Friday before Rhinebeck, because we figured people were going to be in town. And if you had a break between your classes, that would be a really great time to pop over because we're only 15 minutes away. And we had so much fun. We did it again in the spring. 
in June. Uh, and then, of course, that sort of set our schedule. And then, of course, COVID hit. So we did a virtual farm day. And the thing I learned that I just hadn't even occurred to me yet, right, because you think in your own world, is that people from around the world could join us when we were able to do it virtually, just like probably here today. And yes, I saw the comment come by. My mom joined us. She uh, dyed some yarn for us with Kool-Aid, which is pretty amazing. And in fact, you'll permit me a little brag. Here's the urine my mom died. Oh, oh, that's gorgeous. It still smells like wild cherry. <laughs> <laughs> that is fabulous. So you can have scented knitting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you use the stuff without sugar in it, right? So it's not going to get sticky or gummy or anything. Right. Other people <laughs> make them cakes or whatever. It makes me yarn. It's awesome. <clears throat> So yeah, you were saying you had people from all over the world that tuned in to these these the your virtual farm days, right? Yeah, and uh, what's really neat about that is everybody's able to comment on you know how things are going in their world and share different projects that maybe you don't get exposed to because you wouldn't see them in a local yarn shop. Uh, so Louisa Harding, for instance, she's a designer that I have admired for forever, and. Uh, when we could do these things, right, Vogue Knitting Live, she turned out to be our neighbor. So we got to meet her and her husband and their friend Em, who was helping out. And uh, that made a connection where, oh my goodness, we could start to knit some patterns once we got her, once we got her book. And uh, then we were able to communicate later on. So here we are halfway across the world because she's in the UK working on patterns and uh, sharing ideas here. And uh, I can't wait to see what she's going to come up with next. If you don't have her book, this is one I highly recommend. It's called Shawls, Wraps, and Scarves. You get that right. <laughs> okay, I still need to learn how to do this. There we go. Great. Uh, but this is the Tansy Wrap from there. It's our current knit along project. So we're learning lace, which is yarn overs and knit two togethers, if that's new to you. And Amy, do you have a class on that yet? Um, I do not yet, but I'm always interested in what people want to learn about. <laughs> Mm. So I actually, 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 Aaron, I do have a lace pattern that's coming out in probably March. Um, that's going to be like lace for people that don't really do lace, like simple, oh. easy to memorize, <laughs> great first lace pattern. So people can keep an eye out for that. Yeah. And one of the things that we have been investigating is called reading our knitting. So you know where you are in the pattern, no matter what you're looking at. And that really helped because in learning to do the SSK versus the knit two together, right, it's just two decreases that lean opposite each other. And when you know what you're looking at all of a sudden, you get used to that, then you don't have to worry so much about what does the pattern say? You can kind of let it go on autopilot. And you talk about easy to memorize and don't have to worry about it. Breaking that down into little pieces so that you can put them all back together makes for a pretty awesome project. So, yeah. so what's it gonna be, can I ask? Um, it is going to be a very lightweight, um, in, I'm, I'm trying to decide, is it, it it's sort of a, an infinity shawl. Um, and so you wear it down uh, around your, uh, like your upper arms, um, or scrunch it up and loop it twice. Um, it, Cause I'm doing it in um, a lightweight yarn from Louisiana Yarn Guys. Yeah. And it's got some silk in it. So it's super lightweight and it's sort of scrunchy and a lot of open work, so. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. And for something that needs to really stretch out, you know, I think that's a really great point about picking the right yarn for the project and uh, having, getting to meet Josh and Dwayne this summer when we were doing fiber roll yeah. together, I got some of their Merino silk because they had this great tank pattern that I wanted to knit. And I was thinking about doing it in our yarn, but because it's so buoyant, it wouldn't stretch the way that lace pattern was designed for so it was neat to be able to meet them and get to try out their yarn and yeah. uh, know how it turns out when I finally get it on my needles. <laughs> yeah, they've got some really nice yarn too. And and that's exactly what I'm using. It's their Silk Merino blend because I wanted both, I wanted the ability to block that Merino gives lace, but also the little bit of the drape from the silk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you find the right project for it, like this one, this is our lace and this you can see against my black shirt. Um, a good blocking, right? Never underestimate what that can do for a yarn because this lace is straight up 100% merino. Yeah. And just my favorite way to do this, if you'll permit me, right? Give it a bubble bath. 
right? So just a little bit of detergent. I like palm olive. That's what works really well with our yarn. Um, and, uh, or some really inexpensive shampoo, right? Suave, it used to be like $2 a gallon. So you can get a lot of blocking out of that. And just wash it in lukewarm water and then rinse it in water that's the same temperature, wring it out, roll it in a towel. Uh, our friend Vanessa and her son Calvin say, like you're making a burrito, right? Really, like, <laughs> be afraid, you're not gonna hurt it. And then I like to spread it on a cut pile carpet because mm. there's just enough connection because a lot of those have a bit of wool in them too that it'll hold it without having to do mm. any of the pinning or wiring or get it on mats. And you've squeezed out so much water, it's not gonna hurt the carpet and then come back the next day and it's dry and in the shape that you want it. That's awesome. I do have some of your lace weight yarn and I really love it. And I haven't, I haven't finished. I have a, I have a beaded cowl that I'm working on that got set aside because I had a bunch of other things I was working on. I need to get back to it. Um, cause that's great yarn for lace work. And I love the way that hundred percent Merino just spreads out and will hold a block if you are really trying to open it up. And I agree, you know, other than lace, I don't really, I don't hard block my stuff. I don't like stretch it because most of the things you, you, you want it to be in a sort of a relaxed manner. You know, if you make a pair of socks, you don't want to stretch them when you block them and have a bigger pair of socks. You want the socks to be sock size. So I just lay them out flat and kind of pat them into place and they do what they're supposed to do. <laughs> and you are so generous. I just have to admit I'm lazy. That's why I don't pin the darn thing. <laughs> I, do, I admit I do. Um, I use my usually use blocking wires for for lace stuff because I really love how it opens up. Like there's I don't know this one. I've got some Indian cross stitch in here. If I can find the sections um, that just I mean they look like nothing until you pin them out and then and then they just they just you know turn into these they they open up so so prettily and yep. I just love that. Um, yeah. Very so, cool. Yeah, I just. I love what a nice blocking does, but you know, only when it, only when you need it, you don't need everything to open up, you know? And, um, but as we like to say, right, if you're going to knit, you're going to wear it and I hope you will. And if you're going to wear it, you're probably going to want to wash it. And I hope you yeah. will. Don't be nervous about it. The sheep yeah. get wet whenever it rains and they want to go outside. So it's going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you're going to wear, you're going to wash sweaters pretty commonly. And so sweaters, like you don't want to knit it out in, I mean, you don't want to pin it out every bit, every single time you wash it. You just, you know, I have one of those mesh drying racks, you know, and I just lay it out flat the way it's going to go. And that works. Perfect. Works really And the nice. cool thing about wool is that you don't need to wash it every time you wear it. No. Pretty amazing properties. Um, I think there's a, there's an athletics company that says this is unstinkable. And yeah. I went, the, is it wool? Because that would be really easy. And no, not so much. But uh, let's see, it was probably two years ago, we had some uh, fitness influencers from New York City come up on a tour of the farm. And the Woolmark company, that's the Australian Wool Board, was trying to make wool fitness gear, which they mm. did. And it looked awesome. And their challenge to these influencers was, you have to wear this same workout gear every day for a week. And we're going to give you the workout too, which was pretty wow. intense. So if you can picture some, you know, really buff types doing things like this and jumping <laughs> in front of our. <laughs> I've been seeing ads on my Facebook feed um, for, I don't know who's making it, but, but, you know, like wool t-shirts essentially. <laughs> um, and they're saying, oh, and you could just travel the, if you could travel, I guess you could travel with just this one shirt and you never have, you know, you could wear it for a couple of weeks on your, and it's <laughs> not going to smell bad. And, you know, and. And, and I believe them. I don't know why they're trying to tell me, sell me things to travel in right now. <laughs> I tell, tried telling people about that um, in one of my sock classes. I was explaining yeah. about how, you know, even wool socks, when you take them off, if at the end of the day, if you give them a sniff, they don't smell bad. There's no wool, it, you know, it inhibits bacterial growth and it really doesn't smell bad. And I know that there are a lot of traditional cultures where they don't wash even their socks every time they wear them. You know, um, I, I, I do, I still do wear my, wash my wool socks every time I wear them, but it, I, I, I be, I'm becoming convinced it might be unnecessary. And then, you know, I make some, I've made some socks out of non-wool and boy, those need to be washed every time for sure. <laughs> Well, I can vouch for that because my friend Anne, she wore the same wool dress for a hundred days straight over the summer. And it was amazing to just watch how you think, oh, wool dress all summer. It's so lightweight and it has this great property where it absorbs the moisture, whatever you're sweating and releases it to the atmosphere. 
you know, to help regulate your temperature. And she looked so calm and cool, no matter what else was going on. And anybody who wasn't wearing that wool dress was just, you know, sweating bullets. And it's amazing. She, she said she needed to hang the dress or she hung the dress at night. And not only did it air out, covered all the wrinkles too. So you didn't even have to do anything special to care for it. I think Anne just commented in the in the chat that <laughs> she's here, Anne. <laughs> That's awesome. I um I went I was um on a thing with Arna and Carlos, and they were saying, you know, they have some hand knits that were from um, one of their fathers, and a, a hand knit sweater that was done by uh, his grandmother for his father, and they keep it in a cedar chest, and he still wears it. Uh, Arna does, and um, he's never washed it. He said in, in Norway, in the winter, you just hang your knits outside in the freezing for a couple hours and the, the cold takes care of any problems. Perfect. <laughs> for us, anyway, not so much for you right now, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's a big advocate of steam blocking it. He actually does not submerge his knits to before <laughs> blocking because he's, he's never actually going, for, going to really wash them. That's another fun one. I like to do that a lot when I'm working on Fair Isle projects. And this one being a sock is probably going to need that. Um, but this is the bit of a, uh, color work. It's going to be a slipper. And uh, Amy and I have this idea about maybe collaborating on a sock project. This design is from 106 meters from the road. It's Irene Wagner. And uh, she has this really cool book about knitting in the high atlas. So this sock has a much different toe construction than I'd ever seen before. So it took me a couple to get it right. And I'm loving it because it looks like it would wear so well. And I'm thinking, Amy, your sock class that teaches us how to build these so they fit us would be a really, really neat combination with this project. I am excited about this. Erin, you only told me about this this morning. I'm really excited to take a look at this book because I, I think there's <laughs> There's so there's so many different knitting traditions, right? Wool is wool is is in part of so many different um, different cultures in different places in the world, and everyone has their own knitting traditions and their way of traditionally doing things. And you know, we're kind of so fortunate right now that we can learn from you know, if you want to learn Estonian lace, right, or if you want to learn how to spin like they do in the Andes, or you want to you know, you want to do really traditional Fair Isle or or Norwegian color work, um, we can learn these things and we get to choose the things that that really appeal to us or that we you know the techniques we want to learn, and then we get to apply those techniques you know, to other things. And we, we wind up, you know, I think knitting in America today is this fabulous mishmash of, you know, well, I know how to knit in the Fair Isle style, but I'm going to take that and apply it to something else. Okay. I'm trying to come in. Can you see the wool pants? Oh my word. That's <laughs> wonderful. That's wonderful. That so I, I love the notion that, you know, we can take this traditional, totally different toe construction and use the principles that that I know from doing sort of very traditional American socks toe up about sizing and fit and how we know where to put shaping and, and kind of plug in this really traditional technique. And I'm just, it's almost like a garter tab when you start a shawl that way. So you mm -hmm. start with this little itty bitty square and then build from there. And I'm thinking, wow, because Irene gives you the tradition of how these are made and you use whatever tools you have. So if you don't have a knitting store close by and bicycle spokes are what you've got to use as knitting needles, <laughs> why not, right? That may be all you have in a remote village. And if you need the yarn of a particular size, you have to spin it. And if you run out, you just spin more. You don't have to worry about matching it with anything. You just keep, keep at it. So with one size needles, whatever yarn comes out, that's what you're going to end up working with. So some of these are working with a worsted weight yarn on size zero needles or the equivalent mm. of, but think about, wow, how well that wears when you have the right. Yeah, that it wear like iron. <laughs> <laughs> Not just because you have the right breed that is, you know, we call it a strong wool, something that is going to wear really well in a high traffic area, but also then putting that together with a really, really tight knit, it's just going to give that construction the strength that it needs to last. And hey, if you're gonna put all the work into it, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really cool. And I'm excited to, to check out that book. That's some good stuff. If 
else is interested, I was trying to hold it up before. It's called Keepers of the Sheep, and uh, you can find it on, uh, Irene's got an Etsy shop. It's called 106 Meters from the Road, 106, or just Google Keepers of the Sheep, and she's put the patterns, um, the mentions of them on Ravelry, and there's a link to the book from there. So really, really cool read, and uh, I have this idea that we could kind of you know, get Irene to come talk to us about uh, knitting in the high atlas and her experiences there and uh, turn that into kind of a fiber journey while we're all still here home during COVID. So if you want to hear more, make sure you're on Amy's mailing list, our mailing list, morehousefarm.com forward slash flock, because I'm getting really excited about being able to share these, these different traditions with everyone. Yeah, and I'm getting super excited about some of the plans that you've got for this year. I think there's going to be so much fun going on. And, um, you know, this is this is the thing. I know COVID has taken so much away and, and canceled so many events and so many people in the fiber industry are struggling. Um, but it's also birthed so much creativity. And, you know, we've been to, be able to go to these virtual fiber festivals and we've been able to meet online and, and to do to, to knit with each other via Zoom and to, you know, there are there are new video podcasts and there are new events that are out there now. And I mean, they're just, you know, compared to nine months ago, um, virtual, you know, so many festivals went virtual this year. Um, I was. I was having such a hard time finding them all that I started a, a list of them right <laughs> on my blog oh, because <laughs> because there are so many of them and their things are really ramping up for this year and um and I just kind of love that that we can visit it you know I couldn't possibly travel to all these places but but we're we're able to do it virtually and I've been able to visit your farm virtually and we've <laughs> I just got an email from the Connecticut sheep and wool breeders who would traditionally do their festival on April 24th. So they're keeping an eye on things. They said, block off the date one way or the other. We're going to do something, whether it's in person or virtual. So fingers crossed. We want to be safe about it. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maybe by fall. And Amy, you think we can get you teaching at Rhinebeck? You're not that far away. That's right. Well, you know, by, I certainly hope to be going some places by fall. I am. I do have um, a couple of a couple of places where I am right now scheduled to teach in person in the fall. So, uh -huh. you know, I really <laughs> hope it happens. I really hope it happens. But at the same time, I am busy, you know, um, scheduling my spring with virtual teaching because that's just because uh, you have to. Right. <laughs> Well, and that's it. I mean, to me, that's amazing because I met you when not uh, this past November, the one before, yeah. so that yeah. just over a year ago. And you were talking about this idea about, wow, I want to be a knitting teacher and how do I get this started? And, you know, listening to you plan that out and then put the pieces together and, you know, submitting to different festivals. And then all of a sudden it's virtual. Yeah. And your market is no longer just people that are in that one area where you are. But you've been able to connect with, I know, folks that knit, have been knitting with Morehouse for quite some time. Uh, you've made a relationship with Josh and Dwayne. So you're working mm -hmm. on Louisiana yeah. stuff. And uh, yeah, I'm seeing comments come through that. We've got new knitters during COVID. Yeah. Awesome. Welcome. So glad to have you with us. And your journey is only just beginning, right? Now that yeah. you've got yeah. it's a fit and pearl, if you can do a yarn over, everything else is just a combination of those things. So find something yeah. you like on your list and take a class from Amy or come join and knit along with us and you'll be doing it in no time. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. There, there has been opportunity and I and I think that's, you, you're right, Erin. It, you know, a, a year ago, you know, I was teaching at the at the local schools, you know, and, and the local community center and things like that. Um, but Zoom, you know, Zoom made a lot of things possible, virtual platforms in general, right? It's not specific to this one, but, um, but yeah. Miami. Have you figured out how to set it up on your students' end so that you can see what they're doing? Oh my gosh, I had the funniest experience. <laughs> One of my very first classes, maybe my second class, when I was teaching at Fiber World last summer, my second festival class, um, I had someone who was just having such a hard time and she was on her laptop and I actually coached her to turn her laptop around, facing away from her and hold her hands up and then I just said, higher, lower, to the left. Okay, now knit. Let me see what you're doing. <laughs> and we got it figured out, you know, because it, I, you know, because sometimes 
most of the time, you know, I have my, my cameras set up and people can see my hands and I try to just go slow and repeat it a lot of times. But yeah, once in a while, you just can't, and when you, you, you have to see what someone's doing in order to tell them how to do it differently. Um, and actually it turned out to be a gift because I watched what she was doing and I had to t change the words I was telling in order to, it was, we were working on Judy's magic cast on with, for socks. And I had to change what, what I was telling her how to do because she wasn't relating to the way I was explaining it. Mm -hmm. And the way I, I changed is now the way I teach it. It was just more relatable and it made more sense to people, especially when I couldn't be there with them in the room. Yes. And for a teacher, it's easy if you can stand there next to someone and say, okay, wait, no, move your finger this way or to push the yarn this way or, um, or I stand right next to them. But, but when you have to do it remotely, I think it pushes you as a teacher and it's, it's helped me be a much better teacher. Definitely. And I was messaging with, I had, think I had three different times the same question came up today because we've just started this wrap. And the way Louisa describes it, bead one, you put the bead on the stitch, but then you also work that stitch. Mm. And when you're purling that stitch and it says purl the next stitch, you know, how, what does that count? And in, in the words, right back and forth, our minds can play tricks on us in terms of, did I read, did I read the way you wrote that? Or did I read what I think I'm trying to read? you know, as someone's asking me the question and um, thank goodness we're, knitters are just patient people and so awesome to stick with it to keep, you know, getting to the answer because we want to get it right. It's not about rushing through it to say, okay, when it says bead, pearl, bead, that's actually three different stitches. Yeah. And it seems like counting is right, something we learn as small children should be one of the easiest parts of knitting, but it's really, I think, underrated in terms of how many stitches does it take to bind off one? Mm. Right. You need two. You need two. So yeah. If you do just one stitch bind off and you count that as one, it's one bound off, but you're on the second stitch on that particular yeah. row. And if you're just bumming right along and not thinking about it, you could end up with your stitch count off quite yeah. easily. Yeah. And wait, back it up. Let's try that again and we'll get it. But uh, when we're on autopilot, we don't always think about that or we're just reading yeah. it, you know, as we want to rather than it's actually written. And I have created more than one goof. <laughs> well, it's so important. This is why it's so important to, to have test knitters and to really have good conversations with test knitters about, you know, what was where did you get stuck or where what was tricky for you? It's not just hey, can you make the thing from the pattern, but where did you where did you have to read twice, you know, or where did it not work and you ripped out? because that's the thing I want to know as a designer, where did someone not understand clearly when I, you know, for example, if you're, if you're doing increases, depending on the increase, right? If, if, mm -hmm. if I, as a designer, I try to specify what kind of increase. And if someone wants to use a different increase, I can tell them, Hey, you can use, I'll say in the pattern, but if so, if I'm specifying a knit front and back, that takes a stitch to make an extra stitch. Whereas if someone's doing like a make one that doesn't use a stitch. Oh, and right, again, right. like you say, your, your, your count can change. And if you, if you, you know, we all have our own ways of knitting. And if we all are, if, if you design something, cause you're used to knitting a certain way and you don't take into account other people have different frames of reference. I have to, I have to think about everybody's different frame of reference and address that. And that's tricky to do. Cause I was working on a uh, test knit for Mary Melchior. She's got a really cool hat. Ah, that's got some miter squares in it. And um, as I'm working on that, it says at one point knit through the back loop. And I have to think about that and translate it into my own knitting. I started combination purling or mm. Eastern purling when I suffered a bout of tendonitis and absolutely love it. Wish I'd learned it sooner, but it seats the stitch on the needle in a different direction. Right. And yeah. that means um, in order to knit the stitch flat, I am doing what a lot of people think is knitting through the back loop most of the time. Mm -hmm. So when I teach, I like to talk about a right leg and a left leg. Mm -hmm. And you'll know when you twist it because you see that twist. Yeah. And if you just put the needle in the hole, as Patty Lyon says, you won't have a yes. problem. <laughs> then when you want, it's like a little extra work because you have to yeah. set it up differently to make that happen. Yeah, it's very important. I um, It's funny. I get myself in trouble when I teach my um, basic knit fixes class. One of the things I teach is how to recognize twisted stitches. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But before I can teach how to recognize and fix twisted stitches, I have to first talk about how do needles sit on, how do stitches sit on the needle? And the first thing I get into is we get into this whole discussion of, okay, this is a Western concept of how stitches are supposed to look on the needle. And if you learned from the Russian tradition or Turkish tradition or anywhere sort of East, very far Eastern Europe, um, it's, it's going to be mounted the other way around. This is a Western centric way of thinking about how stitches should be. And so, you know, I sort of have to give that context before I can then say for most of us, you know, the right leg is, is, you know, this is where it's forward and it's in front of the needle and we call it the right leg forward of the needle and we go in this way. Um, but I try to ask, like, you know, in any class I could have somebody, who who knits you know their standard is the other way and that's fine right we just okay you do it this way we do it this way um but that's why you can't make a, real generalizations i like to say there's not there's no always in knitting that's because, for darn <laughs> because i i okay here is the one always i say for anything in knitting there is more than one way to do the thing and <laughs> right. for each of those ways you will find someone who tells you it's the only way to do it <laughs> it's not <laughs> it's the only way they know right now yeah. and, uh, or the way they might think is best <laughs> right so that's why we're really big on learning how to read your knitting so that you know what you're looking at and one of the things that i and when i'm teaching i haven't figured out yet how to do this virtually but i can remember a gracious lady named connie who i found out later was my first boss's wife <laughs> After I did this to her, we took the needle out of the stitches, which gives every new knitter a little bit of a heart attack, right? When you just go, and uh, wow, I just made my knitting disappear. But when you pick them back up, they don't always end up on the needle quite in the same direction or order that you started with. And I think that is a really good place to learn that orientation that you were just describing, that you know what you're looking at and what to do with it next. Because if you're going to knit it versus purl it, you need to have the leg oriented differently or it's going to come out different and that's a really great practice to know what you're looking at and then also what to do about it yeah i i love horrifying people in class um I, because I'll teach everyone how to tink back one at a time and how to put your, your needle in many rows below before you frog, you know, because I always tell everybody bring a much smaller uh, gauge needle to pick them up with because it's so much easier if you have a teeny okay. tiny gauge needle, you know. Um, but then what I, and then they'll, someone will always ask, is that how you do it? And I say, no, I just pull the <laughs> needles out and I rip until I'm about one row above and then I do it one at a time or I'll rip into the row I need and then I'll shove it in any old way and then I'll reorient mm -hmm. because I just, I, I, I want to do it quick. And that's just, I don't, I don't fear it. I know my needle, my stitches aren't really going to go anywhere until I do something with them. They're mostly going to stay in place. You know, they're not when you, you know, even if it's just one dropped stitch, it'll go down a little bit, but that it's not like running away to Reno and shacking up with somebody with a lot of bad tattoos. It's, it's, it's just right there. <laughs> right. And every time I've been worried about it, because I filmed a couple of repairs for this shawl, because I mm -hmm. realized, oh, this far back, I dropped a stitch. And I really didn't want to have to worry about unraveling two inches of lace. Yet I noticed a drop stitch that far back. It was one stitch and it hadn't gone anywhere. So wool especially is great for that because those fibers want to be with friends. So they cling to each other and they don't go anywhere until you do something that makes them go somewhere. Uh, sometimes that can even make a repair tricky because they are clinging to each other. Yes, and you have yes. It kind of coax them up again. Yeah. I love that. I absolutely love teaching that in class because, you know, people think that they have to go all the way back. And I am the queen of drop down or um, thread something through it and duplicate stitch and just kind of hide it. I mean, I just I, I hate redoing stuff. So I will if I really need to, but I will first try all the different ways to, to repair it. So <laughs> I am like, yeah, hey, I might, I might as well spend 20 minutes trying to do this a different way before I spend three hours re-knitting that much <laughs> knitting. <laughs> to tie a little knot around a stitch that was dropped and when it's hidden in a decrease, who's going to know? And uh, I, <laughs> as our friend Anne Marie says, um, if anyone's looking that closely, I'm going to slap them because... <laughs> <laughs> 
It's all about what I can live with, really. And, you know, me and what I what I think is a knitter of the piece that I've made. <laughs> but yeah, you can totally repair lace. And first is figuring out all right, what's the issue that I'm looking at. Did I drop a stitch so I need to make yeah. sure that I pick it up? Did I forget a yarn over? So I filmed a couple of those issues that I ran into. And of course, it's, you know, this far back by the time I realized I had an issue. So great learning uh, opportunity. And uh, I filmed them so that we'll be able to share them during the knit along, which I saw a couple of questions pop by if it's all right, Amy. Can I talk yeah. about the So this is the Morehouse Merino Lace and uh, Louisa Harding's book shawls, wraps, and scarves talks about using a DK weight yarn. If you've ever had her cashmere DK, you'll notice it's a really, really thin DK. And I didn't find that it plumped up a lot when it was blocking. So our lace is actually a yeah, light fingering. So it works perfectly. We did also test it with our two ply sport. Uh, Anne from the I Thought I Know How podcast is with us as a co-host for this month's knit along. And she did a beautiful version in our two ply sport. So you've got two different weights to pick from. And then beads, 1106, which I wish you could buy 1106. Um, and then I dropped some and I'm really glad that you can't buy exactly 1106. <laughs> so on the lace weight, I used size eight. And on the sport weight, we used size six. Turned out really well. And if you wanna use the size six on a lace weight, you can totally do that. Um, this one is a cowl that we did earlier on. And I think just, it's just enough. I just thought, let's give it a try. And the eights will, ob will absolutely fit on the lace if you're looking for something that's not quite as obvious in terms of decoration. Um, but that's gonna be working all January. And then uh, as we get into February and March, we've got a double knitting project that's gonna be coming up and then looking forward to some socks with Amy. So make sure you're a uh, part of the Morehouse Merino uh, newsletter list so that you get notice of when we're gonna be casting on. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin. I'm really looking forward to all those events. Me too. And uh, tell us, where are you teaching next? So uh, I have a, oh gosh, I have a bunch. I've just been, um, I took December off from teaching so I could set up my schedule for the spring. And I've got a whole bunch. I've got um, a couple that I'm going to be doing um, just on my own, selling through my own website and and my pay, pip, my pay hip store and then conducting on Zoom like we are now. Um, January 23rd, I'm doing two color brioche in the round. Um, we're going to make a cowl like this. Not, we won't make the whole thing in the class. It's only a two hour class, but we're going to get started on it. Um, I think that brioche learning two colors in the round is actually the easiest way to learn brioche. Um, so I'm teaching this class again, people tend to like this class. Um, <gasps> and I have a hat that'll match that perfectly. When Ooh. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think there's still space in that class. And then um, on the 30th, I'm going to do a sock class and that is a six hour long, but we will have some breaks. Um, <laughs> it's the whole thing, how to cast on from the toe up. We're going to do short row heels and we're going to learn how to bind off in stretchy bind off. And we're going to make a little miniature sock in that time. Um, so you can learn the whole technique of all the different things you need to know um, how to how to make socks. Um, and then I have a couple of things in February. I'm going to be at the Peace Tree Knitting and Yoga Adventures Retreat, which is a virtual retreat. Um, and you don't have to know or do yoga to do this. Um, I, I, I yoga lately. Oh, man. <laughs> I am not a yogi, but I kind of like that, you know, that there's like some yoga stretches, some optional things that you can do that are good for knitters. Um, I'm going to teach my mosaic class at that retreat, um, my intro mosaic, magic of mosaic class. And then I'm going to teach another brioche class, which is going to be brioche beyond the basics, which is knitting flat and doing syncopated brioche, um, which is just kind of a next step up. If you've taken my um, uh, introductory to color brioche class, you'll be, you would be like, that would be your next step to do that um, February 20th class at the Peace Tree Retreat. Um, or if you are, if you haven't already taken a brioche class, but you're like someone who's ready to jump in and do something a little fast pace, um, you could, you could take that class, even if you don't already um, do brioche, um, as long as you're willing to kind of jump in at a quick pace. Cause I will do, I will review some basics, but then we'll move, move forward from there. Um, and then I have um, end of February, I'm going to do two more classes that I'm just selling through my own website. 
we're going to do um, the skills from the, like the skills that you do in the Glen Barrow cowl, we're going to do oh, elongated perfect. stitches and I-cord cast on, I-cord bind off. We're going to make little um, coffee cozies that are based on this pattern. So, oh, cool. Yeah. So, and I know you sell kits for these, right? So if people want to do, um, want to do that class, they could get the kit and they, there, there will be enough yarn to make the coffee cozy and then to make the cowl. Perfect. So that'd be fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> gosh. And then I'm going to do, um, on same day, February 27th, I'm going to do that basic knit fixes class where we talk mm -hmm. about dropping back or frogging, tinking one at a time or where you can drop down and do fixes and fix if you forgot an increase or decrease and how to read your knit stitches and things like that. So that's up there. Um, at uh, in beginning of March, I'm going to be teaching at the Bandera Festival, March 4th to the 6th. I'm going to teach on class on I-Cord. We're going to do cast on, edging, and bind off for I-Cord. Uh, I'm going to teach my tips and tricks class where we just do all kinds of knitting tips and tricks to make your knitting better. Uh, and I'm going to be teaching repairing wear in knitted items. So like if you have a sock that's wearing thin, starting mm -hmm. to develop a hole or already has a hole or a, or a sweater with a moth hole or something, I'm going to yeah. teach some ways to, to repair your knitwear. Um, and then I've got a couple of classes in April, beginning of April, April 3rd, I'm going to do a lecture um, called What Makes a Knitting Pattern Good for You? So how to judge a pattern and also how to do things like knit the right size, how to do yarn substitution, how, things like that. And um, a new class called Cooler Cast-Ons, Better Bind-Offs. So we're, where we're just going to do a whole bunch of different cast-ons and bind-offs and talk about which ones are stretchy and firm and what kind of um, different classes you would uh, you would use them for. So um, I'm going to... By the way, is that, what's that? Is your schedule on your website? It is on my website under um, it, under uh, upcoming events. You can see all of these class to, classes listed or even just on the front page of my website, I have it on the sidebar. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to post like, I'll just post, copy and post all the links so you can get all my, all my um, various social media and all my different things. Um, and then, uh, gosh, sorry, I can't do two things at once at all. <laughs> I'm really bad at it. Sorry. I'm trying to copy these links for everybody. Um, and, but I will put them, um, also if, if some people are watching on YouTube live, um, I will just paste the links there. Um, so people can see it there. <laughs> I think I got that into the chat for everybody now. Hopefully that shows up. Okay. I know, I know. So we had, I, I loved um, all these suggestions people made when they registered. I asked what techniques people wanted me to, to talk about. And so I had this great list of I, things that people want to know. Um, and so I will, I'm going to share one of those. So Aaron, I'm going to take you off spotlight and thank you so much for all the chat. This is super fun. Um, oh, yeah. I'm going to do the technique that I promised everybody. And then we're going to do some prizes. So I hope you can, can you stick around while we do our prizes too, Aaron? Yes, I will. I'm going to awesome. go. Somebody mentioned something about German short something or others. So I have uh, someone that wants to visit. Oh, fantastic. Yay. All right. Get to that Thanks. tip. <laughs> okay, so we had a whole bunch of great questions about different techniques and things that people wanted to hear about. Um, and a lot of these are covered in my classes, and some of them I have a few little tutorials up on YouTube already. Um, so I just want to point that out. If um, someone was asking about measuring the upper chest instead of the full chest, and I do talk about that in my um in my class on um, my, my lecture on what makes a knitting pattern good for you. But um, when you're asking your question about measuring the upper chest, that is right here under the arm. Um, and that is a um, that is often a better measurement than using a full chest. A lot of times if we measure at the, the widest part of our chest, we wind up with sweaters that are too big for us. Um, this chat, this measurement here, according to the Craft Yarn Council and other uh, official things that tell people how to make patterns and how to size them, this is supposed to be two inches bigger than your fullest chest. It's usually a bigger difference. But so when 
when most designers are working, they're working backwards and they're taking two inches off the biggest part, but that's probably bigger than you are. So what I do is I measure right here um, around this, what you call high chest. Sorry, I'm, I'm not very tall in my seat, but right here, um, as high as I can get a knitting, a, a measuring tape under my arm, I use that and then I add two inches to that. And I use that as my chest measurement when I'm selecting a size. And that gives me a size that fits me better. And I go into more detail in that class, but that's the basic of it. Um, someone asked about um, wrap and turn. I am developing a short rows class. That's more than I can show in the short time we have, but um, I am gonna do a whole class on short rows. And same with the I-cord cast on. Um, I have that technique on a little YouTube video if you wanna see it done. Um, you can check out my YouTube uh, channel, which I put in the chat. Um, and if you want to do that hands on with some help, I have the Glenboro Cal class coming up where I'm going to teach I cord cast on. And also um, in April 3rd, cooler cast on, um, sorry, the, uh, the, um, at the Bandera Festival, rather, I'm going to teach I cord cast on and bind off there. Um, so if you want a little bit more involved in that, um, Someone asked about long slip stitches, which we do in the Glen Barrow Cal, and I explain that in the pattern, and I also have a link in the pattern to my YouTube channel. You could go right to my YouTube channel where I show how to do some um, some long slip stitches, or you could take that class if you want some hands-on time um, working on that together. Um, I had a question that was, can I interchange garter stitch and stockinette stitch as long as I have the same gauge? That is a fantastically interesting question. Um, the answer is yes and no. If you truly had the same gauge in garter and stockinette stitch, you could technically interchange, yes. However, it's very unusual to get the same stitch in garter and stockinette. Generally, Garter stitch is much shorter than stockinette because the way the stitches sit on top of each other. So for most people, you are not gonna have the same gauge in stockinette and garter. And remember when you're measuring gauge, you do need to look at both row gauge and stitch gauge, okay? It, a lot of times you might get the same width in stockinette and garter, but you will not get the same row gauge because it's um, garter is just a lot shorter. So dep depends a lot on the pattern you're using, whether you can substitute that. If you do substitute it, you're probably gonna have to add more rows, which is pretty easy if you're making something straight like a scarf, and it gets pretty complicated if you're doing something like shoulder shaping on a sweater. So um, that really depends a lot on what project you're doing and what you want that knitting to do. And when I say what you want that knitting to do, let's remember that stockinette stitch curls just because the way it's structured it curls from the bottom up it curls at the edges it's just what stockinette does um, and that's because of the way that we putting up we're putting all the pearl bumps on the back and all the flat parts on the front garter stitch doesn't curl it is balanced you're kind of balancing your knits and pearls and that means garter stitch is going to lay flatter that means that fabric is going to behave very differently. It's not going to be as drapey. It will be a little bouncier. And so you're introducing different characteristics. So if you truly could get the same gauge, you could substitute it, but your fabric would behave differently. Okay. Um, someone was asking about stretchy bind offs and, um, that is something that I do teach in my sock skills classes. Um, and I'm going to cover also in my uh, upcoming class on April 3rd about um, cooler cast ons, better bind offs. Um, someone asked about how to avoid the holes at the underarm of a sweater, which is a great question. This um, holes at the underarm have the same uh, the same cause as holes at the gusset of a sock, right? We've got knitting that is going in one direction and then we stop and we turn and our knitting is going in another direction. 
and we we open up little holes when when our knitting changes directions it happens at the um a lot of times when you're adding a thumb to a glove too the easy so there are things that i do i do tend to pick up extra stitches in those spaces and i often will knit them twisted to try to close them and that helps but to really eliminate it um what most the the, the really most foolproof thing to do is to put a little cinch at the end of your knitting after you're all done and you're sewing it ends you, you cinch up the stitches a little bit at the very end and I just recorded a little video so I will have something on my video um, on my YouTube channel in a couple of weeks showing you how to how to cinch that hole up and just make it tight so keep an eye out for that um, and I had another question about um, Judy's Magic Cast On, and I have a video up for that on the YouTube channel. So if the person who wanted a refresher on that, you can click on and you can watch that as many times as you need to do. Um, someone else asked a question about how to make row ends look the same as each other and be neat. And um, that is a loaded question. Um, I there, there are lots of people who believe in doing selvages for every edge in knitting. And I think selvages where you maybe slip, do a slip stitch selvage where you maybe don't, don't knit the, you might slip instead of knitting the first uh, stitch of every row that can look great on something like a scarf where you, you want to have a, uh, a, a nice, even, and maybe um, almost decorative edge. When I'm working on a piece that's going to later be sewn up, I don't do that because it causes problems because it, 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 I only have one stitch for every two rows and I need that, that edge to sew up. So if I'm going to sew a piece together, I don't do anything special to the edges. I really want those edges to, to have all their stitches and they don't have to look particularly any way because they're going to get sewn together. Um, but I also want to show you guys, I'm going to just switch my camera now. Um, I do want to show you one thing that I like to do to have um, a more even edge. And I will, in fact, show both things. So when I talk about a slip stitch edge, um, can someone let me know? This is showing mirrored for me. Is it showing mirrored for you guys or is it? If I, if I knit this way, is that knitting the correct way? Okay, good. Thank you for nodding. Appreciate it. Um, all right. So if I wanted to have a selvage, I do not have a selvage in this. This is just a normal edge. This is how I normally knit and I've left it and you can see it's, you know, it's, it's got a little tiny bit of a bump. Um, but if I wanted to have a selvage that looked a little prettier, um, the beginning of every row, instead of knitting the first stitch, I would just slip it. And I always slip as if to purl, which means I put the tip of my needle in. Um, first of all, sorry about that. That stitch was mounted backwards. So I would put the tip of the needle in as though I were going to purl it and I would move it over that way. And that lets me move it from one needle to the other without twisting it. And then I would just go on and knit the next stitches in the row. And if I do that, I'm gonna have an elongated stitch on the edge. Uh, every stitch on the edge is actually going to cover two rows. And that makes a nice looking selvage. And I do like that for things like scarves. But for places where I don't want to have the selvage, but I want to have a nice neat end stitch, I just, there's something I do to tighten up my ends that I find useful. So if I'm finishing my purl row and I turn, this, this first stitch can often look a little janky and too big. It looks elongated. And we t I, it's always tempting to try to tighten that up. If I tighten this up right now, I'm not actually tightening up what I want to. I'm not doing anything to that. I'm actually just tightening this stitch over here. So I make my first stitch. And I don't tighten my first stitch either, because if I tighten my first stitch, all I'm doing is making the previous stitch too small on the previous row. 
I knit the first stitch and I put my needle into the second stitch. Then I give a little tightening on my working yarn. And you can see now, finally, when I tighten that way, now that my needle is into the second stitch, when I pull the working yarn, that does tighten my first stitch very nicely. I'm going to do that again. All right. Purling this last stitch here. I do have this kind of big oversized stitch on the end, like we often get. Don't worry about it. I knit it. Then as I put my needle into my second stitch, I give this a tug. Everything here tightens up really nicely. And then I just knit along. And you can see there that my edge is now, I don't have that big kind of janky oversized stitch that I had before. That's tightened up nicely. And that's all I tend to do um, for most things. That's a nice, that's a pretty even stitch for me. And if I'm going to be sewing that up in particular, that's a, that's a good solid edge. Okay, I'm back. Thanks guys. And thank you for your questions. Um, lots of great ones. And there were also some other questions about some um, additional techniques that I will um, keep in mind for, uh, for further, um, further classes and things like that. So I know I promised prizes and I'm really excited to do prizes. So let's do those now. Okay, um, I'm going to give away a few things. I'm going to give away some some free patterns and some other things. And Erin has a book copy she's going to give away. So uh, I am going to change my view so that I have you guys in gallery view. And then I'm going to pull up a random number generator. And then I'm just going to count over to the number that the random generator generated. So I will tell you who won. And then I'm going to ask if you guys, if whoever the winner is, please, can you email me? And I'm going to put my email address in here again. Um, it's deviousknitter at gmail.com. Um, I'm going to write down what, who won what, but I'm going to ask you to email me and just mention what it was you won. So that, And I will probably not get back to you until tomorrow because after this, we're going to have some family time and hopefully tomorrow is going to be okay for you guys. So first winner is going to win. Oh, I need to get back to my random gen number generator here. Okay. First winner. And I'm going to say, I'm sorry, Aaron. I think Aaron and I are not eligible. <laughs> <laughs> my first winner is going to win a free pattern of their choice of mine. And that's anything that I currently have. And I'm also happy to, um, to let you wait. If you want to wait till Wanderly is out, you can have that. You can, you can wait and do that too. So the first winner is Peg. Peg, you have won a free pattern. Yay. And feel free to unmute yourself now if you want. You can un unmute and um, congrats. There. Um, so yay, Peg. Yay. <laughs> Very Thanks. cool. So Shoot me an email. Um, so just to let me know, and I'll write down that you get a free pattern. Okay, let's Thank do another. <laughs> we're gonna give another free pattern, and that one is going to. Sorry, my random number generator here. Okay, let's go. That one is going to Jen at Knitting Takes Balls. Jen, you want a free pattern? <laughs> hey, Thank you. Jen. You're welcome. All right, next one. Let me generate another number. Andrea, you've won a free pattern. Yay. So that'll be your choice of patterns. Um, if you already know which one you want, you can email me and let me know which one you want. And you can also let me know if you want me to just email, if you know, if you want me to just email you the PDF or um, if you're on Ravelry, I can uh, do it as a Ravelry gift so that it would go in your Rav library. So just let me know which way you like to re re receive it, what's easier. 
All right, the next giveaway is gonna be the book that Erin is donating. Erin, will you tell us about this book? I'm gonna spotlight you here. All right. Okay. All right, hopefully you can see me because that looks really funky on my end. You must have moved it in front of your face or something. <laughs> <laughs> this book is Morehouse Farm Merino Knits. Um, Margaret Laura wrote this and it's full of scenery from Morehouse Farm and pictures of the sheep, lots of <clears throat> that have come throughout the farm's inspiration. And uh, let's see if we can get this one on here. Nope. Oh, there we go. This is actually my copy that she signed. I'm gonna write one to you, whoever our winner is, but there's some pretty amazing pictures of not just the sheep, uh, but also kiddos feeding the geese on the farm. We've also got, uh, there's a picture of me in here from when I was in college wearing uh, one of the sweaters <laughs> that Margaret designed. So if you wanna laugh and a blast from the past, you'll oh, actually yeah. find me in here. <laughs> That's awesome. After my name. So that is Valley. let's see, 40 designs for you, all photographed uh, at Morehouse Farm and designed by Margaret. So. Yay, and I have a winner. Yes. Charlene Vargas has won. Oh, congratulations. Charlene, my email is erin at morehousefarm.com, one O. If you can give me your address, we'll get that in the mail to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> I don't congratulations, have Charlene. Um, I don't have a pen to write this down right now. Um, uh, what was that again? Or if you want to private message me your email, I'll email you later. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Erin. I love that book. Is that still available? Um, like out there somewhere? Yeah, you can get it on our website. You can get, I think you can get an e-copy of it. Um, but yeah, we definitely have that uh, out there. I still enjoy looking at the things in there. Um, for instance, there's one pattern called buggy mitts, which is a fantastic way to use mm -hmm. up any yarn that you have left over. Just a really good worsted wheat pattern. If you got, you know, three yards of it, fantastic pattern for kids mittens that look like ladybugs or other kinds of critters so that's a good one that's in there that's also a free pattern on our website so if y'all are bumming around morehousefarm.com look for the buggy mitts pattern and i also have a coupon code for y'all devious the next time you order from morehouse farm it's good all month uh you will get a free pair of inner soles just add them to your carts these are felt merino from our sheep and really good, especially if you live in a cold climate, put them inside your shoes for a little bit of extra warmth and comfort. So that is yours. The next time you order, just use coupon code DEVIOUS. Make sure you got a, a pair in your cart so that we know to send them to you. Awesome, thank you so much. I'm gonna write that code down. Thanks, Aaron. That is awesome. Those look really, really good. I bet they would be really good in like in your boots or ski boots or all those things. I have a pair in every um, set of dress <laughs> shoes. Not that I have to wear shoes, <laughs> in, but, <laughs> but that's awesome. Notorious for hurting your feet. So a little bit of extra comfort never went wrong. And uh, especially if it's cold out, great combination. That's <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I hope you enjoy them. All right. I have three more prizes to give away. Um, this next one is $10 off any one of my upcoming classes that I am selling through my own uh, class website. I'm sorry that I can't give you uh, money off classes that are through other people's festivals because I'm not in charge of how that cost structure works. Um, but any of the classes that are that you can sign up through um, my uh, website, through my PayHip store, um, you'll get $10 off your choice of that. And that is that is going to be good um, through um, June 30th of this year. So you can um, you can you can use it for something that's up there now, or I will probably be continuing to add classes. Um, so the winner of that is Janine Carabellis. <laughs> Congratulations, Janine. Thank you. You are very I'm welcome. Taking one of your classes. Oh, I'd love to have you in there. Um, the next, the next uh, prize is fifteen dollars off one of my upcoming classes. Um, all the same parameters apply. It has to be one of the ones that I'm uh, hosting myself. Um, and let me see who this winner is. <coughs> Erin. 
It is Rosalind Green. I can't see the rest of your name, but Rosalind, you're the winner. Thank you so much. You are very welcome. Congratulations. All right. The very last prize that I have, um, I am going to give somebody a free class up to a $35 value in one of my classes that will cover any of my two hour classes. So that would include or um, the, the one hour lecture are all uh, uh, at or under that price level. So that would mean you could take um, the two color brioche in the round or you could take um, the uh, basic knit fixes class, the, the pattern lecture or cooler cast ons, better bind offs. You could take any one of those, or if you prefer, if you wanted to take one of my longer classes like Socks Unlocked, you could apply that as a $35 credit to that. So somebody's gonna get that. Let me see who it is. That's Margaret Carson. All right, congratulations. Yay, thanks. Margaret, congratulations. And if any of you um, don't wanna take that class for yourself, I'm fine with if you prefer to gift that to somebody else, um, we'll email the details back and forth and you'll, you'll get a one-time code that'll let you do that sign up. So thanks guys, thank you for hanging in. Um, I hope the prizes were fun. And I hope that you guys um, learned something new and interesting today. And um, are there any questions that you have before we before we say our goodbyes for either Aaron or me? One more question. Um, what was the name of the book, Aaron, um, that you were uh, that was one of the prizes? So that oh, we could order it on the website. Morehouse Farm Merino Knits. There we go. And uh, I'll give Amy a link. She can share that as well uh, on her social media. And y'all can uh, enjoy it. Great, enjoy. thank you. This oh, was awesome. Also, will you let us know when sign up for the next First Friday is? Absolutely, it's live now. Um, you can find it on my website under the uh, upcoming events. Um, you can find the, follow the link. The next one is gonna be um, the first Friday of February. I have to pull up my calendar and see. I think that's... February 5th, does anybody have that right? Think, yeah, February so. 5th, same time, four Pacific, seven Eastern, and the same in March, it's gonna be the 5th and then April 3rd, and that's as far out as I've scheduled them. Um, but yeah, you guys can sign up and um, I'm good. I, I know my, my guest next month is gonna be Christine from Peace Tree um, Yoga and Fiber Retreats. And in March, I'm gonna have Dwayne and Josh from Louisiana Yarn Guys. And we'll see the April guest has not yet been figured out, but hoping to have somebody fun for you guys. Um, and we have a couple of minutes left. So if anybody's interested in showing me what you're knitting down there that I can't see, I'd love to um, see what projects you're doing. Oh, and somebody did tell me, I know the April link used to go to the February registration. And I think I fixed that this afternoon. So give that another try if you would. So anyone wants to show something, just unmute yourself oh, and uh Trevor Lawrence for Dutch Town. Look. It's Stephen West's uh hybrid knit along. I'm with you. Uh, Alice? I'm I'm knitting knitting um a hat. Oh, I like that. Alice, what pattern is that? Um it is um this one. Pacific North P N W Bricks Hat by hair, Susan Platt. Nice. And, Chris had nice. That's it, and this is um uh from my Secret Santa. Nice. Well, from my Secret Santa, and I I just want to say to Erin, um, um, oh, there she is. I'm Australian and you've got the best merinos there when you got the rams. <laughs> and I, I did put in the chat that I in the fifth I grew up in the 50s that's all I only wore wool because that was the that was the only material around wool. That's awesome. Thank you, Neil. 
And Susan, were you trying to show us? Oh yeah, I'm making your... Stephen, Stephen West hibernate along. Wonderful. So. Oh, I love the colors you've got there. Oh, thank you, thank you. The hardest Susan. part for me is those long floats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're huge. They're like over seven stitches and I'm okay over three. Once it gets a little bigger. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a tricky, tricky, tricky thing. And it just, it's just practice. I mean, you know, gosh, I, if I get involved in a long project and I haven't done any stranded color work for a while, my, my tensioning is so much better by the time I get to the end of it than it is when I start. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Then, anyone else got something they'd like to show us? If you'll call out your name, it helps me spotlight you. I'm Lucy? Lucy, can you talk again so I can? Yes, I can talk. Oh, there you are. Okay, let me add you there. Now we can see you, Lucy. I'm making this, um, it's a cr cr uh, hood and then it has a, it's gonna be a scarf that is uh, hooked up to it. And it's designed by Kelly Hobart from Apalka Direct. And I don't know if you could see the pattern, but um, it's kind of a cool pattern. So you could wear it like a hood or you could wear it just as a scarf. Nice, that looks really cozy. I love alpaca. I love how soft and warm it is. And this is a combination of two colors. So it's sort of, they're very close and, and um, I guess I can't, I, you can see my hand, you can't see, I can't get it, but there it is. So they're very close in color contrast, yes. but um, oh yeah, it's, it's kind of pretty. And my daughter lives in Portland. So um, this would be very ideal for her in the cold weather. Nice. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more. Does someone else want to um, show us something? Um, this is Fiona. Fiona. Oh, sorry. Oh, Jen. Sorry. Hi, Jen. Go, go ahead. No, Fiona. go ahead. We'll do Jen and then we'll do Fiona. Okay. Um, well, I just finished the, um, the couples, uh, snowflake couples beanie. Um, yeah, this is a really fun, uh, quick uh, color work knit. Yeah. That's awesome. Cool. I, you got my, you got my color. You got my teal in there. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Combo. <laughs> Jen, that is far more impressive than my attempt at a pair of socks where I've got this very, this very gappy stuff going on here. <laughs> so I was, I was, I was, it was helpful oh, to that's... you explain how to fix that up. Oh, there. some gaps in the, now show me again, your gaps, that is not from the gusset. That's a gap. That's to do with your short rows. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what short row technique are you using there, Fiona? Um, I have no idea. Okay. Okay. So is it actually gaps or is it just that that's the, that looks to me like that's just the shape of the stitches. Are you seeing holes behind them? Oh yeah. No, hand there's, in? Hole, there's holes. Behind oh them. dear. Okay. Okay. So that's to do with how you make your short rows and that's not really the, the kind of gusset hole that you would just be able to cinch up it very, very easily. Um, what I would suggest for you there is on your next pair of socks, maybe do a different short row technique. Okay. Could she weave some yarn through to could, fill up the holes? You could, you could do, you could take some spare yarn when you're, when you're um, weaving in your ends and you could do a duplicate stitch um, just to kind of put some extra yarn in that area. Um, or you could decide that as long as it makes a sock that's not falling apart, that that's a design feature. And now your socks have a nice little lace work design on the side of the heels. I like the latter idea. <laughs> as long as it makes socks, right? Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Amy, I'm sorry to interrupt. I wanted to mention I just registered for the podcast and April still um, shows up as February 5th. Okay, thank you, Julia. I will investigate that again. It might be tomorrow, but I will investigate it again and um, and I will get that working appropriate. That was from my website you were linking? Yeah, I went to your website and I just clicked on each month and um, it all works fine. But April, when you you know click on register, it, it February 5th comes. Okay. Um, um, that probably explains why no one's registered for February yet. So I will try to get that. I will commit to getting that fixed by tomorrow afternoon. Okay, you guys. Okay, great, great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you all so, thank so much for being you. here. This was super fun. Aaron, thank, thank you for you. being my guest and for all the for great gifts. Just you, looking through here Wonderful. to make sure I can message Charlene. Okay. Email address. 
Great. And, and yeah, and um, if you have, if anyone has trouble getting in touch with each other, you reach out through me as well. And that's, and I will, I will try get you in touch with Aaron if we need to do it that way. Aaron, I have, I have a pen now. If you want to give me your oh. email address. <laughs> Aaron at Morehouse Farm, M-O-R-E-H-O-U-S-E. Aaron at Morehouse Yarn. Farm.com. Yep. I'm sorry, Aaron at Morehouse Yarn Farm. Yep, like what's behind yep. me, Morehouse oh, Farm. Okay, yep, dot com. I will send yep. you an email. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, for this. Fantastic. It was a wonderful, Thank you. It was a wonderful time. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Right. And happy Thank New you. Year. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Awesome. Bye. 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 Thank you.